So you want to be root on a Linux box, but you don't have that pesky root password. Well, in this video, we're going to go through two Linux privesks that are actually kind of nuts, and they don't require a single bit of memory corruption. They are strictly logic bugs. We'll go over how they work, and I'll give you a quick demo of me exploiting both of them to go from an unprivileged user all the way up to root with just a couple of button clicks. It's pretty neat. So today we're chaining together two vulnerabilities, CVE 2025-6018 and 6019. 1.8 allows you to run 1.9. So 1.8 is a really interesting vulnerability in the OpenSUSE, it's a German word, uh, OpenSUSE's implementation of PAM. PAM is this thing that's known as pluggable authentication modules. Basically, applications that are PAM aware depend on PAM libraries that explain to the application what the user is and is not allowed to do. You can use these PAM libraries to query things about the account's authentication, about the account's session, stuff like that, and then PAM will tell you if you're good or not good to do those things. And by the way, one way to keep yourself safe online is to stay ahead of attackers by knowing what's going on in the world of black hat cybersecurity, and one way is to use the tool from today's sponsor, Flare. Flare is a threat exposure management platform that can see if you or your company is a victim of recent cyber attacks. Here you can see all of the sources that Flare is collecting, and within them is 18,000 private telegram channels where cyber criminals are actively talking about what they're doing. Like right here, Flare has picked up a vendor on Telegram selling an exploit for AppKey. Apparently they have RCE in AppKey and a PHP unit exploit. There isn't a CVE publicly associated with this data, but you can now know that if you have one of these applications, an attack may be incoming. And Flare isn't just a visibility tool. Here I have my email addresses and domains put into the Flare system as identifiers for events. And then when events happen, I have alerts set up where Flare will email me saying, hey, we found a password for your email. Hey, we found a leak for your domain. I can use this to quickly respond to cyber attacks with no lifting on my end. Working with Flare helps me keep this channel moving and if you want to help me out, go try Flare at the URL down below. You get a free trial while supplies last. Hey, Flare, thanks for sponsoring the video. Let's get back into this exploit. Now, places like Ubuntu, where this bug is not vulnerable, do not have these issues in PAM, but OpenSUSE had a really, really interesting bug. OpenSUSE's implementation of the PAM environment module there was an issue in the ordering of how it read this PAM environment file. The environment of a CPU is very straightforward. Basically in the computer, you have these things called environment variables that kind of set paths or set commands or set files for your computer to take certain actions, right? So for here, for example, I have an environment variable that says my shell is bin bash, my TTY for the session is dev PTS one, and there's a, you know, my print working directory, I'm currently in the home hacker folder. Now the issue with environment variables is some programs depend on them to do certain things. For example, the PAM stack, the pluggable authentication module stack, passes variables around through the environment. So if an attacker is able to control environment variables, it can lie about its own authentication parameters. It can say, oh, oh, by the way, I'm actually authorized to do this. I'm actually authorized to do that. And that's exactly how CVE 2025-6018 works. Basically, an attacker that is not privileged, that can log on to a box, is able to tell the pluggable authentication module system that it has the ability to do things such as rebooting the system or mounting disk drives. What you're giving yourself is this flag known as the allow active flag, which basically says that you are sitting physically at the computer. Now understand, this is not a privilege escalation yet. We haven't necessarily escalated to root, but we are able to lie to system D, the messaging bus underneath the hood, and tell it that we have privileges as if we were sitting next to the computer on like a serial console. And as you can see, the way that we do this is very, very simple. All we have to do is create a file that tells the XDG bus that we're sitting in seat zero and that we're doing a VTNR override. If we set both of those equal to one and put it into PAM environment, when we log back on into the system, the way that the SSH server and the PAM modules are stacked up, it'll just say, oh, okay, these are all true already. The user is obviously sitting on the box. And we can test that by trying to reboot the system. It'll challenge us and say, uh-uh-uh, you can't do that. But if we log in with these authentication variables set, we can 
can reboot the system. Now remember, this is a privileged escalation vulnerability. So you're taking yourself from a place where you already have access and are using that to get a higher privilege. So here we're gonna make this GD bus call. We're gonna ask the system bus, hey, do we have the privileges to do a reboot? Are we allowed to reboot the system? We're gonna send this and it's gonna say challenge, which means no, normally it would do some kind of challenge for authentication or some kind of token, which means that we do not have this privilege. But what we can do is we can modify our PAM environment to have these two variables. Again, we're going to inject environment variables into the PAM system to tell it, oh, hold on, we're actually physically sitting at the computer which is just amazing to me. So we'll move PAM environment back to PAM environment. And now when we log into the system, we can run that command. We do can reboot and the answer is yes. What this means is that the PAM stack thinks that our session is a session of a user that is physically sitting at the computer. Now we're not root yet, but this allows us to run the next vulnerability that does escalate us to root and it's even cooler than this one. The reason why this is so neat is normally it's not a good idea for you to be able to inject environment variables anywhere, any place that you can put an environment variable that isn't at your privilege level, like maybe the LD library path of a daemon, for example, you now control the specific variables that the program depends on as its reality, right? It trusts the environment that it's in by default. So if you can modify those things, you're now in control and we can lie about the nature of our PAM session. The nature of the session Second bug that Qualys found, 6019, is also really interesting. If you're not aware of what a set UID binary is, let me show you real quick. It is a program that when it runs, it gets escalated to the privilege of that user, right? So sudo, for example, is a program that when you run sudo, the current context of that program is being ran as root. Now the logic in the program makes sure that you can't just do anything as root. It's on you or it's on the program to make sure that it firewalls you, but sudo is being ran as root. Now, what happens if we make a file system that we then move to another host and then mount that file system? Do set UID binaries turn on on the remote file system? Most of the time, that's not the case. But in 6019, they found a weird hack to make it so that you could use a set UID binary. By having the allow active from the previous vulnerability, by having that authorization in our session, what we can do is temporarily ask the XFS daemon to resize a file system for us. How do you resize a file system? Well, of course, you have to mount it. And it mounts it without the no set UID and no dev flag which means that temporarily for a microsecond, an XFS file system can arbitrarily be loaded and the set UID binaries that we bring with it are set UID. So we can bring any arbitrary set UID binary that can be ran as root. Ah, but if it only resizes it for a second, how do we make use of that? Well, what Qualys found, I'll move my fat head for a second. If you put this while loop on the target system, what this does is it prevents the system from being able to unmount the drive. So what's happening is the drive gets mounted with the malicious set UID binaries that the hacker brought with them. It's trying to unmount it so the hacker can't use them, but this while loop is holding it busy so the, the daemon can't turn it off. So then while this while loop is running, you're able to go into that file system and run your set UID binary. Let's walk through it right now. So what I've done here is I've done a little make FS XFS image. This is a file system image that I'm able to use on loop devices. A loop device is a device in Linux. You're able to take a file that is acting as a disk image and you're able to mount it to that device. We make that file system and then we're able to go in there and put our goodies. Now what I've done here is I've taken on my local machine. This is not the target machine. I have a set UID version of bash. When I run this version of bash, I become root, it is a set UID bash binary. Now again, I'm on my computer. I don't need to be root on my computer, I need to be root on their computer. So what I'm able to do is as an attacker with access somewhere else, but I don't have privileges yet, I'm just gonna SCP this binary up to the system. We're gonna go, you know, with our hacker password that we have, we're gonna SCP this image onto the target file system. So first we gotta kill this daemon that makes sure that it's not going to automatically unmount it for us, which we can do because we have the privileges of that daemon. And then now what we need to do is we're going to mount this image. And you will see that it temporarily mounts it as dev loop zero. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the while loop that will lock up the resize and then quickly go and try to resize that image. What that will do is temporarily mount it with the set UID binary set. So what we'll do is we'll do the while loop and it's set for 10 seconds. I'm actually gonna do 100 
100 seconds real quick. We'll just do that one. And then so now this while loop is hanging and it's spinning and it's opening all these files, right? Now, when I ask the computer to do a resize, it's gonna say that it can't do it because the target is busy. What that means is it is temporarily mounted at this location. And when I try to run this program, I am now root on the system. If you type ID, I have ran my own local copy of a set UID bash on the system because it was going to resize it. And when it resized it, it didn't turn off the no set UID flag. So my effective user ID is root. So these two bugs, the first bug only affects OpenSUSE, and then the second bug affects any distribution of libblockdev. So if you're on Ubuntu with libblockdev, I would go patch this, I would go you know, update the version of libblockdev that you have. Very, very neat bug chain. I think these kinds of bugs are super neat because it's not a memory corruption vulnerability where doing it wrong is gonna take down the system, or you need to like have some kind of crazy memory leak to be able to bypass kernel ASLR. It is literally, I guess, kind of a timing attack in the way that the file management system or the file system handles these block devices. Very, very neat stuff. You need to have the same privileges as can reboot. So unless you have a um, another way of getting that privilege, you're not gonna be able to do this, but you know, it's just, it's, it's worth patching, I think, regardless. Now, the question that we're all waiting for, could Rust have fixed this? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think Rust would have fixed it. I think um, this is a bug more in like a system level architecture design issue or like a timing issue, uh, one that the memory safeties of Rust would not have fixed. Now, maybe if all of this happened in a single Rust binary, maybe the uh, thread safety of Rust would have saved this, but even then, I think it's more architectural and logic based than it is memory based. So that's it for now, guys. Thanks for watching, I appreciate it. I hope you liked this video. If you did, give me a little kiss on the cheek right there and then go check out Flare. Go show them some love, guys. I was talking to the Flare researchers. They're doing some cool work over there. And then after you go check out Flare, go watch this video, which I think you will enjoy just as much as this one. You're gonna like the way you look, I guarantee it. Okay, guys, we'll see you later. Goodbye.